Today's podcast is supported by David Smith of Edward Jones. Are you happy with your financial strategy? Or maybe you'd like to see what other opportunities are out there. Or give David a call at 469-372-1587. That's 469-372-1587. David is only concerned about one person. That's you and your financial health. So check him out. David Smith, Edward Jones, 469-372-1587. Hey everybody, it's the Trout. Hope you're having a great day. Today's episode, we take you across the pond, as they like to say, to the country of the United Kingdom. Where I'm interviewing a, a gentleman that's been involved in the music industry for years, but he's just done about everything you can. And it kind of reinforces the idea that once you're bitten by the music bug, it never goes away. Ross Hemsworth is his name. And he owns a company called Remote Highway Media. But he started his life doing things like driving semis or lorries, as I like to say, for famous people like Paul McCartney, Brian Adams, Beyonce, written songs for, you know, TV and BBC, and continues to do that even now. So he has an interesting story about his life, how he got where he is now, and how he just continues to do what he wants to do, which is be a singer-songwriter. And he talks about that on our show today. So up next, Ross Hemsworth with Remote Highway Media, all the way on this other side of the planet, in the United Kingdom, talking about his music career and his musical journey. That's next on The Trout Show. you involved with transporting band equipment or you were a truck driver for hire or were you doing something like that where you I, I I saw that where yeah. you I thought you were doing some of that which that yeah, trying to intrigue me because I've never talked to anybody that really did that. I mean I've never talked to roadies usually I'm talking to the people that perform. So no, tell, no tell I did that for quite a while. Did it for quite a few years. Um it was it paid very well and it kept me hand in with the people that I used to know and work with and I toured Europe, Eastern and Western Europe, for a company called Transam Trucking and Edwin Shirley Trucking. We did Paul McCartney, Brian Adams, Beyonce, Barry Manilow, all sorts of people, um, Springsteen. There's various tours that I got involved with that were fun, other tours not so much. Um, but it was it was just a great thing to be involved in. And we we got to operate spots for some of the acts as well, do the spotlights and stuff, which obviously was extra money. Uh, but it was just good fun. There was a great camaraderie in the early days with the truck drivers. Uh, those and the bus drivers were always seen as the lowest of the low in a tour crew. <laughs> so when you go into catering, you have to go in when everyone else is finished, you know. But um, but some of the other, some of the smaller bands when we went on tour, we were just sitting there next to the artists, and it was great because once they realised you were actually an artist yourself, you've been doing this stuff, things changed. And I actually had one of the guys from Brian Adams' band come up to me when I was sitting in the cab strumming my tailor, which you can see up on the wall yeah, there. See that, and yeah. he said, hey, man, I didn't know you could play. And he took the guitar and had a go himself. Obviously, he showed me up because he could play it much better than I could. But <laughs> it was just a nice thing that, you know, all of a sudden we were starting to be recognised as being more than just a roadie, if you like. 
Yeah, good times. Who was the biggest tour you went on as far as how many, well, you call them lorries over there, but how many vehicles did you have that you went like, oh my gosh, it's like we got 20 of these things behind us? Who was the biggest I one? I think the went? biggest one was probably Beyonce, 64 trucks and 120, <laughs> 28 drivers because there was double drivers all the way through. So 64 trucks. 64 trucks, yeah, and 128 drivers. And, um, not all of them fun to be around. One got arrested and sent home on tour for fighting. Uh, there were a couple. I think one got um, reprimanded for something we won't mention on air. Uh-huh. It's, it was a fun tour in many ways, but not so much in others, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But you know what? It's, it's funny now. That's what they have to do to make money. They don't go on yeah. tour. They don't make any money. I mean, there's no, no money sure. in the music business as far as you know. And we both know that as far as, you know, records and all that stuff. Nobody buys them anymore. But. 64 track and all i can think about when i see stuff like this is i hear this this sound ka-ching 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 yeah. and and i and then i think okay sh- they're spending a tremendous amount of money she's making a tremendous amount of money or they wouldn't be able to have 64 trucks to okay. carry the stuff around in. i mean well, let, me tell you, let me tell you a quick story while we're on this subject which i'm sure yeah. you'll appreciate uh, on the mccartney tour we'd all loaded into uh, munich for the big gig there at the, um, I think it was the Olympic Stadium, if I remember rightly. Everything was set up. We were there for three or four days. And obviously the truck drivers get the time off once they've done their job, not needed again till the loadout. Right. And lead driver came over to me and he said, Ross, he said, "Um, would you like to do me and Paul a favour? So I said, (laughs) favour? You always know when they're asking you a favour, you're not going to get paid any extra for it. You know, that's my (laughs) favour. So, so I said, Paul's, in there, Paul's name in there just to make you go, oh, yeah, yeah sure. exactly. Yeah. You've got it. So what Paul wanted to do is he used to fly out either on the day or on the night before each gig and then fly back home because he has a little place down on the Kent Surrey border. Well, I say little. And on this particular occasion, he didn't want to fly out to Germany. So he flew the band back to rehearse at his home, at the studio near his home that he, he also owns. And he wanted two trucks to break down the gear that had already been set up on stage, bring it all the way back to southeast England, and then take it all the way back to Munich to be set up ready for when he flew in the next day. And the only way logistically they could do it was to have two drivers drive it out and two different drivers drive it back because of the limit on driver's hours legally. So they took me and a guy called Mickey, who was a legend in this business. He really has been doing it longer than me. Um, they they flew us up to Schiphol in Amsterdam and then by train to the Hook of Holland. And at the Hook of Holland, we waited for the other drivers to come back. Strange, because normally from Kent, uh, Surrey, you'd come back through Calais. But for some reason, they came back yeah. through this, this place up in Suffolk. And from Harwich, I think it was, they went to the Hook of Holland. We swapped drivers and we drove back down to Munich. And somebody came up to me the next day and said, any idea how much that cost McCartney to oh, do that? I can imagine. I said, what, in his terms or mine? He said, in his. I said, Tuppence. Because when you've got that kind of money, yeah, it, it probably didn't even make a dent in the balance. No. It was just what he wanted to do and he could afford to do it. Sure. So I think you're right. There's a ching factor without a doubt, but it gives some flexibility to do stuff that you and I could only dream of doing. So mm-hmm. you were doing that. Then you decided. Tell me a little bit then about your musical situation. Were you 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 start? Were you playing, or you just messing around, or you decided you want to go into do the other stuff and the engineering and all that? Was that at the same time? I sort of like- sort of had had quite a long break from playing. Um, I used to tour a lot as a teenager, early twenties. Then I started to realise my real talent was in songwriting rather than playing. I used to enjoy playing, but I was never going to become a pop star. I've got the perfect face for radio, really. So that was out the window. I think the the guitar playing was average. You know, I could strum along with the best of them, but not right, m- much yeah. beyond that. So I started to look at where I could actually make my mark, and songwriting seemed to be the area to go in. So I started to write. I got signed by some of the world's biggest publishers, people like Carlin Music, Rack, various others. What was, um, what was your genre, would you say, that you were writing? Was it pop music? Or back, I mean- back then, I suppose it was pop and rock. It was, um, when I say rock, the light end of rock, sort of the 80s, um, Glam rock. So oh, okay. Okay. I was doing a lot of that. Um mm-hmm. when I wrote for Susie Quattro, I was I was writing with her in the in the style of where she wanted to go. She wanted to cross over and become like a female Springsteen around that period. Mm-hmm. And I actually thought, well, actually, she could do that. 
Yeah. She's got the style, she's got the look, she's got the following. So we started to write some music that I thought would actually work. But then she went off in a different tangent and she did her own thing for a few years. And funnily enough, we were talking the other day about doing some more stuff together. So where does she, where does she live? Her. Where does she live? She, li- she lives over in Essex, the other side okay. of the country to me. But it's not a problem now because everything can hook up by computers. So yeah. We can work remotely without, you know, she's got a lovely big country house. She's had it for years. And I used to go over there and we'd, I'd just take a guitar and we'd turn up and I'd strum a few things to her and she'd write the lyrics. And it worked out pretty well. Um, funnily enough, one of the songs that she put on the Girl from Detroit City CD, we've actually just covered with somebody else as a ballad, completely changed and reformatted mm. the sound of that song because we both always always believed it was a good mm-hmm. song, but it just never felt right the way we did it. And the way that we've redone it with a local singer down here it's shown the potential now of how we could redo the song and actually release it. So I don't think music ever dies. It just gets reborn occasionally. So as we've gone through the years, I've got more into production, more into songwriting, more into working with other artists. I managed a band called Ouch, which funnily enough, we were talking earlier off air about the the band in Holland that were Beatles. um, I, I managed a band called Ouch, and Ouch were um, a boy band from Kent, but they had that Beatles sound so perfect. Mm. If you didn't see the faces, you'd have thought it was the Beatles. They were that good. We had three top tens in Japan. We got signed up out there by Sony, and um, they took us out on a tour with Udo Artists, who's the biggest promoter in Japan. Mm. So we went off to Japan for a while. They made some money. They did really well. Came back here, got a whole string of TV shows they got played on radio one which is our biggest radio station or was at the time and it looked like it was really going to happen and then just as all bands do they split up (laughs) they all do let me go back to your songwriting let me ask you about your songwriting are you do you write on a guitar piano as it come to you just write it down tell me a little bit how you how you do it i always used to write on guitar uh usually on electric sometimes on acoustic more recently it's gone full circle it's piano um, I've started to learn piano. I've been with a piano teacher now for a little while, and I'm certainly not good at it, but I'm good enough to be able to write the structure of a song on the piano. Um, and one of the latest songs that we've remixed with uh, with Tim is a track called Loneliness Road, which is one of my personal favourites songs I've written. It's a real Springsteen-inspired song. Mm-hmm. And I, I went back on the remix and put a whole piano line on there that wasn't on the original, mm-hmm. and it changed the song. It really yeah. changed it because obviously Springsteen stuff normally has piano. Yeah. It's one of the yeah. big parts of the of the way the E Street Band sounds. So I actually went, I don't copy other artists, but I, I do use those inspirations. And Loneliness Road, which will be the next single after the one that's out now, for me, has everything about it that says who I am as a writer, who I'm mm. inspired by, and where I want to go with it. So it's not really a case of, oh, Springsteen's in the past or Springsteen's this. It's more about what I think is coming and what I think is missing from today's market. Because I don't know about you, but I'm bored with some of the music now. The the charts in the UK are stale. Concerned about your financial health? Then reach out to David Smith with Edward Jones. 469-372-1587. That's 469-372-1587. He can conduct business where you are. Get your financial health checkup with David Smith with Edward Jones. His number one concern is you. That's David Smith with Edward Jones. 469-372-1587. It's the same old, well, same old. I, you know, the problem is, and this is the thing, and I had this conversation with a great artist that I interviewed last week, and we were talking about it. In fact, he's getting ready to go on tour. I think he's maybe come to the UK, but anyway. It's it's uh, t- t- the music has gotten to the point where it's boring, and mm. I said I say this to a lot of people. Why do you think all these major people, Spotify and all these people, buy up old catalogs? Because nobody listens to the new stuff. They do, but they all revert back to pre ninety stuff, or they want to listen to stuff that's before two thousand, whatever it is. And his music was um, more like the seventies, eighties classic rock. Yeah. And 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 I said there are people in our there has to be lots of people in our age group that want to listen to music. Now he's younger than me. He was probably in his 40s maybe, but but they don't have any place to go. So what do they listen to? Over here you listen to classic rock or you listen to something like that. 
The one thing that I think has changed, and, and I think it's unfair to writers, is music publishers now want 50%. That's the first thing they say when they start talking to you. They want 50%. They're wow. not prepared to put anything up front. Now, I've got no problem with them having 50%. If it's your shirt and my shirt on the line, you're going to work harder. But they take the 50% and they sit on it in the hope you're going to get it away. So now I won't sign my stuff unless they put money up front. Yeah. So they say, well, we don't do that anymore. That's old school. They don't put money yeah. advances up. I, I, well, same thing goes, my shirt and your shirt. You show me your commitment by putting an advance on yeah. the table and then make it work. Make If you really believe in that song and you believe that song is going to earn money, you're not going to have a problem putting a small amount of money up front. Yeah. So I've sort of, if you like, put a gate up to my own songs, which is probably a detrimental effect on my career. But I just don't believe in giving things away. No. Uh, at least, you know, I, I'm of an age now where I want to be able to leave something for the wife when I go. She's, I'm lucky. She's a bit younger than me and a hell of a lot prettier, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think I can leave her something when I go. So I always have that thought at the end of my mind. But the other thing, of course, as is, I suppose, with any songwriter, is you're always trying to find that one song that suits that one artist. Because mm-hmm. if, for instance, Miley Cyrus emailed me now and said, Ross, send me a song. I've got a catalogue of over 200 songs. Which one do I send her? Because she's not going to listen to the second one if no. she doesn't like the first. No. Therein lies the big, big problem, because you don't know what she's looking for. Yeah. So apart from sitting down and having dinner with her one evening and pl- playing her 20 songs, you know, and you only get to do that when you're a personal friend, yeah. those obstacles are just always there and always will be I, and you're 100 right i think getting people to get their time is one thing and what i've, I've learned is they will give you the time and I, and i will tell you this every artist i've interviewed even some of the bigger ones have never said i gotta go they want to mm. continue to talk to me which is a mm. was a wonderful thing for me but I know how to keep them in tension. But just like you said, you can't call her up and say, hey, and if it, the one, and the other thing I learned about this working in, a, in another job was you don't go to the agent, you don't go to the manager, you go to the publicist because the yeah. publicist gets paid no matter what. Agent mm-hmm. wants a percentage, so they're not going to talk to you. Manager wants a percentage. Publicist looks at it as a, is this going to help them? Is this mm-hmm. going to, you know, what's, is it's, if I spend five minutes or 15 minutes on, the, on interviewing them or whatever it is, is this going to help them? Well, it's not going to hurt them, you know, mm-hmm. and, and why I do a lot of independent artists is because they can use that in turn if they're good. I mean, look, out of the dozens of people I've interviewed, there's probably maybe two or three that really could make it big. Bonnie Wright's Grammy. And Diane Warren's recognition, because Diane Warren is probably one of the best songwriters in the world. I don't think anyone would query that. No. Um, she's your average Joe. She sits on Instagram talking to your average people. She's got a cat the same as I. <laughs> we both love cats. She's non-assuming from that point of view. No. But, my God, that woman can put a song together, yeah. you know. Um, and funnily enough, you were talking also just now about um, Nashville. I wrote country. I, I, every now and again, I dabble with country, but right. obviously I'm not from Nashville, and I usually get criticised because I put English words in it that the Americans <laughs> don't understand. Like, what's the platform? <laughs> it's like this. But um, I wrote a song called "Night Out in Nashville," and a brilliant lady. If you ever get the chance to interview Alice Offley, she's really, really talented. And Alice over here is doing a lot of the dancey sort of stuff, the modern stuff. Behind the scenes, she co-writes all sorts, and she's very good with country. She can take off a Nashville voice like that. Mm. She really can sound American. Mm. And she rewrote Night Out in Nashville uh, Night Out in Nashville with me and said, look, if we change this and change this lyric here and change that there and change the middle eight, and she pulled the song apart, rebuilt it. It came back as a different song, and I wasn't sure at first. And the whole story behind Night Out in Nashville is about a songwriter who loves being in the darkness, doesn't want the fame, doesn't care whether anyone notes notice. They go out drinking in Nashville. Nobody gives them any hassle. But there's just that little niggle in the background of, well, you know, I wouldn't mind a taste of that fame thing. You know, I sometimes get fed up that people don't notice me because I've written all these hit songs, you know. And that's what the song is about. It's about this songwriter. And it's loosely based on the Diane Warren thing. You know, she huh. could walk into Nashville and obviously musicians yeah. know who she is, yeah. but the general public might not. 
Yeah. I think my main focus at the moment is really on three things, writing more music because I know I'm going through a creative phase now. And, you you know, as a writer, you can go through long periods of blank. Yep. So being creative, you've got to use it. As you say, when that inspiration comes down on you, you suck it in, you throw it out. That's right. You've got to make something. Never be afraid to write with someone else because of the changes they can bring to the table, hence Lennon McCartney, George Harrison Ringo, as you just said. Yeah. Um, As far as where I'm going, I think at the moment, yes, Remote Highway is a media company, so we're focusing now on also doing podcasts. I've just made the second edition of Witch Busting for two local witches near Glastonbury. (laughs) Uh, Sounds weird, but one of them is actually a PhD in AI, um, Dr. Liz Williams, and the other one is an academic historian called Trevor Jones. Both of them are practicing witches, and they decided to pull all the myths and legends apart and actually bring fact to the table. So episode one dealt with were witches really burned? No, they weren't. They were usually hung. Um, what were the witch trials at Pendle all about and who was involved in them? And they were usually over land disputes, nothing to do with witches. In it's episode all about two, money. All about money. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it was about money and land. Yeah. Uh, episode two, they looked at the witch finder general, who was a, a real infamous character here in England, uh, who basically was called in and, again, money, paid lots of money to find the cause of a problem in a town. And, of course, it was usually a witch. And they would dump them under the water if they drowned Skate or they were probably innocent. Yeah. If they floated to the top, then they were definitely a witch and had to be burnt or hung. So, <laughs> but it's just a great show to do. So as a producer, I just bought the production techniques that I use in the studio, sure. microphones and whatever, and said, well, guys, come in here, let's do this thing. And it wasn't a massive start. We got 150 downloads in, I think, 48 hours. That's so I was good, really though. pleased with that. Yeah, I was yeah. pleased. I thought, you know, for an unknown show that nobody's ever heard of, yeah. through Podbean, it's done really, really well. So now we can build on that. Um, so I've got two or three other podcasts, one of which I'll be presenting myself. Um, so that that's one of the areas I'm going down. Obviously, the music, I've still got the label. I'm still doing the writing. Um, and I'm also looking at pitching to BBC over here because I'm now, my company is a registered supplier for the BBC. Mm. So I can actually pitch ideas for radio plays, for podcasts, for various other things through the filter that I've got there. So they've just announced their commissioning round for the spring. So I'm pitching a couple of ideas into that. So yeah, I'm trying to keep a wide spread because obviously we need to get the power notes coming in, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, But at the same time, not losing the focus of what the company is all about, which is really about music. There's a guy over here in England called Danny Robbins, and he's doing a job that I did for a little while. I had a TV show over here called Now That's Weird, which was also a syndicated radio show uh, some years back. And it went on to TV because it was picked up from radio. And what Danny's done is he had a podcast called Uncanny, which is all about the paranormal, something that's been done to death, in my opinion. Now, I think everyone's been there, done that. Right. But he picked up on a witch uh, farm in Wales with a witch history. And he really made a big thing out of it. He made about 10, 12 episodes of this particular thing, bringing up to the climax of what caused it in the end, et cetera, et cetera. So he put the facts together pretty well, brought some good witnesses in. Uh, he got it on Radio 4, which is a BBC station over mm-hmm. here. He got a lot of followers. But now TV have got interested, and he's just announced yesterday that he's picked up a full TV series with the BBC based on the podcast. Right, and he started with his podcast. So, yeah, so he's gone now. He's right up there now. He's up with the big players. And and I think that's where it can lead. If you're doing something like you're doing there right now, you never know where that's going to take you because before you know where you are, you know, you've got the Rick Trout's TV show, <laughs> which people are going to be climbing all over to get on because yeah. – You're there, you've got a big platform of listeners, and they want to be part of what you're doing. It's not too bad right now. I mean, I'm in a position now where I've come off the gas a little bit and said, right, okay, I'm going to do what I enjoy doing for as long as I can. Um, But you're quite right what you said just now about inspiration and where things come from, because the current single was actually written about my previous marriage, um, where I had a very rough time in the divorce. And... I came out of it. At that time, I hadn't done my law degree, so I had no idea about the law. I got a solicitor that wasn't worth tuppence. Um, (laughs) I got completely screwed. I lost the house that I'd been paying for for 16 years. That was my pension. Um, I lost my family because she just, you know, 
talked she said all the wrong things to them that make them not want to stay in contact and it just all went pear-shaped and for a little while it was that grudge thing you know oh I'm going to get revenge of some kind I'm going to do this and then I suddenly realized that every lesson you're taught in life is exactly that it's a lesson make use of it take positives from it don't throw negatives and that song came to me around the time I was thinking that and I wrote the title came first Girl, my money sure looks good on you. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought there's a song there. That's Australia. absolutely a song, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, how many people can relate to it, you know? And I sat down with a guitarist called Robbie Bevan, who's in a Dire Straits tribute band, and he started picking some Mark Knopfler-style licks on the guitar, and I said, yeah. come on, you've got to go write this with me, fella. We've got to do this. And he'd had a similar experience, I think, because he could relate to all the facts. And we just sat down and we penned that song in about 30 minutes. It was just like that. It just blended and it just went. And Tim Bragg said, oh, well, let me do the drums and the bass on it. So we did. And then we ended up throwing it into the album mix for uh, for Tall Stories on Short Street. So it was an inspiration that came out of nowhere, but it came out of somewhere, if you understand what I mean. Yeah. You have a good <laughs> evening. I'll continue to be in touch. Okay. Cheers, Rick. Much appreciated. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Well, thanks for listening to this episode of The Trout Show. For more podcasts, or if you'd like to see this on YouTube, visit our website at thetroutshow.com. Special thanks to Ross Hemsworth from Remote Highway Media. For more information about his website and his music, go to remotehighwaymedia.co.uk. Remotehighwaymedia.co.uk. He's in the United Kingdom. Anyway... Stay tuned for more episodes coming up real soon. I hope you enjoy the show. And as I always say, remember, it's only rock and roll. But gosh darn it, I love it. Until next time, see ya.